and thank you for joining us for the Spiritual Leadership Podcast. My name is Larry Chapel, and I'm joined with my dad, uh, Paul Chapel, and we are excited about the conversation that we're going to have today. Dad, we're going to be talking about biblical preaching and teaching. I think this is a topic that touches so many people. Um, just to get us started, though, would you uh, take a minute and just define what biblical teaching and preaching is? Well, obviously, it's it's expounding the truth of God to a world that needs to hear the gospel uh, is the central message of God's word. And it is, for many of us, a calling. Uh, Paul the Apostle said in 2 Timothy chapter 1 uh, that he was set apart as a preacher, or I believe in verse 18 he said, appointed a preacher. So there are some of us who know that this is our appointment for life, but then in the broader sense, every father, every Sunday school teacher, every counselor uh, can benefit from what we're going to talk about today. So dad, how many decades have you been preaching for now? Well, I've been preaching for 40 years. And of course, our church, as you know, Larry, is a traditional model church in the sense of our schedule. Uh, so that means I've preached uh, most every Sunday morning, Sunday night, and uh, most Wednesday nights until recent years, I've been sharing that with you and some of the guest uh, speakers and others. But um, in, in, and also I've preached in the college chapels and school chapels. So preaching is really central to my calling. And that means study needs to be central to my calling as well. But Paul told Timothy, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And it is amazing how a body of believers and how uh, young people in a Christian college need those elements, the, the reproving at times, uh, sometimes uh, the exhortation, but always with long suffering and doctrine. So uh, finding that balance uh, to be biblically centered, but then to have the grace of the Holy Spirit in the midst of it, that's been my 40 year journey. And uh, I've certainly thanked the Lord for it. We just got done with a, a revival here at our church with Dr. Getch. There's a lot of different variety in terms of styles um, uh, in preaching, but what would you say, what, are, what is the core of biblical preaching? Uh, there's, there's things that I think we would all see and say that's, that's not preaching. So right. what, what is preaching at its core? Well, the Greek word keruk speaks of a, of a declaration. Um, the word didaskalos is different, the word teaching. Uh, but we need both, and I think one of the things we'll discuss further today is, is the nature of preaching being expository, is, is, is the type of preaching that we have uh, really tried to emphasize here, just verse-by-verse verse preaching. Sometimes uh, pastors have more elaborate outlines, sometimes less so, but as long as it's biblically derived and not someone superimposing their concept of, of what they want to talk about onto a text, it's always a great blessing in my life. And uh, so preaching is to rightly divide the word of truth. That's why I'm such an advocate for Bible college for those that are called to preach because uh, we, we have such a weighty responsibility in rightly dividing the word of truth or as, as we might say, cutting it straight, you know. Yeah, and, and, and standing behind the text and not in front of it. Uh, Absolutely. So, Dad, why don't you, as we're kind of just getting into this uh, topic, what has been your approach here for our church family as far as how you plan out what you're going to preach, whether that be series or books? Will you talk through that? Sure. Uh, you know, when Paul talked to Timothy about being apt to teach, um, he spoke there about being skilled in teaching. And I think uh, besides the actual impartation of the truth, there is a skill to the planning of the presentation of the truth. And so for me, in the, in the planning of truth, I like to take time. Uh, every summer, as you know, Larry, uh, my, my summer break is divided in three parts. It's first focused on family, um, and I'm so thankful for you and, and uh, your brother and sisters and, and of course, mom. Uh, so I, I enjoy just focusing on the family there for the first part. Then I focus uh, another season, a week or so, on just reading and replenishing my soul. Mom and I will read some books together. And during that time, I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting a lot on my Kindle, and I'm bringing a lot of that content into folders uh, for the last part of my break, which is uh, sermon preparation. So 
Uh, I, I do a lot of sermon planning normally in July, and I do a lot of sermon planning in November and late December. And in that sermon planning, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, all right, on Sunday morning, what are the needs of the church? What are some of the things happening in culture? What, what are some <clears throat> books of the Bible that speaks to these issues and so forth? So uh, as you know, right now our theme on Sunday morning is courageous. And so uh, this past fall, I chose 13 areas where I feel uh, our church family can grow in courage. And some of that deals with family leadership, sometimes stewardship, sometimes our witness. But then uh, going to a text that deals with uh, living courageously. On Sunday nights, of course, we're preaching through Romans verse by verse. So there uh, I'm studying and uh, I'm setting a folder up with Romans outlines that has the chapter and the verses, and uh, normally you know five to six verses per week, and I'm I'm reading through those, and I'm at least establishing the chapters and verses, the titles, and a rough outline, and uh, so uh, this is our primary focus: is uh, a a themed exposition on Sunday morning and a verse by verse exposition on Sunday night. Uh, and I think something Dr. John Getch said once that was great, he said, expository preaching is more a philosophy than a method. And, and what he meant by that is, it says something about how you view the scripture. Uh, it is a method, expository preaching, but it is a philosophy that says, the word of God is central to the life of Christians, and so I want to handle it uh, accurately and contextually. We'll get into uh, uh, some of the nitty-gritty and development of a sermon. But, Dad, just real quick, as you talk through even the planning of a series, what, what is, what's the most difficult part for you? And what part of the sermon process, whether it be the big overview of the series or uh, really developing the outline, what's the most difficult for you and what requires the most attention? Believe it or not, it's, it's challenging for me to establish the flow of the sermons at the top end. Like normally every January and February, I like to focus on stewardship and family. I just feel that those themes need to be addressed early in the year. Uh, so one of the challenges for me is not being redundant because I've done this for you know 38 years in one church. So I want it to be fresh both in the, in the text, the title, the illustrations, the the uh, the preaching itself, uh, but it's challenging coming up with uh, the right flow, and and I like to think in terms of number one, God is the audience of all of this preaching first and foremost, but then secondly, what what's sitting out there in the congregation, and I, and I I pray over uh, the needs of young couples, the needs of singles, the needs of senior saints, you know, and I think sometimes. Some preachers have like tunnel vision in that area. I think we need to understand there's a lot of needs there. For example, if I'm going to preach on the family, I want to wrestle with the fact that I've got a lot of broken families and single parents out there, and I want to have content that's biblically helpful for them. So I would say that high-end planning actually takes me hours and hours of prayer to really just decide what to preach. And then secondly, after that, I would say the development of the outline itself once you get that skeleton there, uh, you can really take a lot of the reading you've been doing. You can, you can throw in some of the content from uh, different commentaries, and you can, you can have support verses. So the two hardest things are the, the high-end selection of where are we going, which is why churches should make sure their pastors get some time away to, to get that established. And then secondly, the outlines themselves. That's why, for me, with the college and my regular preaching schedule, even in other churches and conferences, I really need to have those general outlines for three months out when I come back in July from my time away. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that really helps. This kind of dovetails what, you're, what you were just talking about as well, just kind of your personal preparation. Will you talk maybe about how you prepare, but maybe also some uh, advice to maybe a younger preacher in terms of how you prepare uh, to step up to the pulpit and preach? Well, you know, personally, I want to prepare my life. Um, and, you know, Paul told Timothy, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. And I, I think every church uh, really deserves a pastor who's personally prepared. 
So I want to prepare myself through the week. Uh, that is going to involve prayer. That is going to involve repentance. That is going to involve um, you know, making sure that my relationship uh, with my wife and family and with other people is right. And so just, just having the basics of the Christian life uh, in operation there. And then secondly, uh, as Spurgeon said, I'm going to soak myself in the text. So I'm going to take time every day, and I usually start this on Monday morning, uh, just reading the texts. And I'll read through the text two, three times a day. Uh, and even though I'm still formulating the outline, I'm still going back, I'm willing to change that outline throughout the week. Uh, so I'm preparing myself, I'm, I'm soaking in the text, I'm praying over this message. And then I also pray over our members and spend time with the members. So I'm listening. Uh, you know, to, to, to know the needs of people, you spend time with people. To know the solutions, you spend time with God. And so I am, I am in the sense of uh, application, trying to understand what's going on right now in our community. Uh, maybe there's a, a major incident in our community or a member that's been here a long time that passes away. I need to be willing to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit to adjust the sermon or even change the sermon. So, and then carrying that into Friday and Saturday, I like to get real quiet Saturday and just again, go over the physical outline itself. And uh, normally, I know you don't probably won't believe this, but normally I'm taking two or three pages out of my sermon on Saturday night. And uh, pastor's kids are notorious in their younger years for telling dad how long the sermon was. I tell you, I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's news to me. <laughs> so I actually do take a couple pages uh, out. I was actually, I was going to ask you that. If there's anything else you want to add to your prep, but I know, um, as you just mentioned, part of uh, writing and developing a sermon is obviously what's going to be in it. And then what's not, and I, you have decades on me on preaching, but I know a mistake that I've made at times is feeling like everything that I studied needed to be in the message. Um, yeah. And there's other times where, you know, maybe uh, some will fall in the trap of being reactive to something that's not in the text either. So what gets in it and what, what is not in it and how is that important? Well, I think this is, this comes to the area of kind of meditation. And uh, I think preachers need to be given to meditation it was said of Joseph, behold, the dreamer cometh. I think, I think there is a something about being a preacher that's hard to sometimes explain, but it's always on your mind, and you're always you know, really uh, dealing with uh, good, better, best, Larry, as far as um, there's lots of material you can bring to a message. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking good, better, best, and even down to the illustrations, you know. That's a great illustration. It's even a funny illustration, but it doesn't have a lot to do with this point, you know. Um, and the same could be said for support verses. I don't want to just have a bunch of verses in there just to act like there's lots of verses. So I really try to make sure that there's a flow. I want, you know, you're going to have, I normally, my, my sermons always have a text, a title, and then of course you go into the introduction proposition. Um, and I want to make sure that these these points then are building upon one another to a final conclusion that comes back to that title so that the application is very clear. And sometimes in my preaching, I've had great three great points that didn't tie up real well at the end. So I, I come to the end and I ask myself, okay, what am I going to ask the people to do with this? You know, always there's going to be a gospel emphasis, but uh, what is the other main theme of this text? So it's really a, important to meditate on clarity issues to make sure that I think we've all heard guys that had great content but they had so much of this disconnected content that you kind of walked out of there going that was good but I don't know how to carry it out of here and um, I think that's something that the Lord has taught me is is to, to give clarity so kind of along those lines um, I, I've heard before the question asked do you preach to, to fill pews or fill heads and you said a moment ago that God's the primary audience. So I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Right. I think you can do both. But uh, let's talk for just a second about the context, knowing knowing who you're speaking to. It may be an Easter Sunday where there's far more unsaved than let's say a Monday night at a leadership right. conference. So will you talk a little bit about context as far as knowing who, and then uh, kind of like along the same lines you were saying a moment ago, um, our friend Naranjan one time said, uh, information uh, is getting getting it out but communication is getting it through how do you know that you're getting the message through where it's resonating yeah 
Well, when I think of the context of preaching, of course, there's two things that come to my mind. First is the context of the passage. Uh, you know, I want to give the background, and we'll talk about that later. And then secondly is the context of the audience. And, uh, and, and that's where a preacher who's really called to preach, he's, Larry, he's really bearing a burden. He's, uh, and the burden is just what you said. How do we get this information through? How do we, how do we convey this truth? So when I pray and think about our congregation, uh, I, for example, I think right now we're living in a tough age where people are inundated with information and, and trials, and, it, and, and there's a lot of lethargy and sometimes lukewarmness with people. And, and that's a burden, you know, because you want everybody marching forward for God. So if you're preaching, say, on soul winning or evangelism or missions, uh, I'm thinking in terms of the context of Scripture, the context of the need, and then the context of our people. And how do we bring all of that together and go forward? And, um, and, and it's important then for a pastor to know, well, where are we in soul winning? Uh, statistically, where are we in missions? You know, and and, and that, that helps with knowing the burden. Um, and so these are just some key indicators that a pastor is, besides the study of the scripture, he's considering. Uh, I think you should know in your community how many single adults, what's the percentage? I mean, our, our, our community is about 40% single adult families and maybe 45 now. So again, those are factors to consider. Um, is there anything you want to add about the sermon prep? I just want to make sure we've... No, I, I would just say that for someone who's called to preach, that means that the rest of his life will be spent getting ready for Sunday. And I think uh, if there's a deacon or a staff member that's with us today on this podcast, just to try to bear that in mind that when you're a blessing to a preacher or lifting his arms up, you're helping someone that's going to help your family on Sunday. You know, And, and uh, for you guys that are preaching every week, uh, I want to encourage you, you know, push away from the other things. And I'll, I'll confess one of my sins right here on the podcast. My son's here. I, I have... Uh, some some competing spiritual gifts and interests and so i love administration larry larry one time said to me you know dad you don't have to solve every problem because if i hear about a problem i want to get in there and help fix it and uh these days uh, i'm so thankful for you and some of our other leadership that are fixing a lot of the problems because what it does it gets me back into the word and i think that we have to constantly as pastors push away from problem solving or hopefully not time wasting you know internet browsing type things, hopefully just pushing away from what may be good in order to do what is best, and that is time with God. I, I kind of want to uh, wrap up with asking a few questions about um, tools that you use and that help you in preaching. What are some ways that you get the church family excited about it? Um, your thoughts on visuals, visual aids, um, and then will you kind of wrap up this podcast by just talking through uh, the invitation and how that can be done in a Christ-honoring way. Okay. Well, uh, with respect to tools, uh, I, I think books and commentaries are like the mechanics toolbox, you know. I would say that you need to be cautious with, you know, what tools you're using. It's like, uh, I sh I'm sure a good mechanic wants a good name brand, maybe Craftsman. He doesn't want something from the dollar store for rebuilding an engine, right? So I think it's important that you select wisely. Um, the older a pastor gets, he may be able to use particular authors that uh, maybe lean into you know Calvinism or maybe lean into some some you know areas of, of uh, interpretation that we would disagree with. Um, uh, but you can still pick out the the meat and leave the bones. So what I'm saying here is to build a conservative library. Um, but I don't preach a message without reading uh, four to five commentaries on the passage. So I'm going to read four to five commentaries. I'm going to study the meanings of the words, the key words. I'm going to study out. Uh, and then I'm going to do some research on where was the author when this was written? Who were the recipients? What was it like when they received this? I love to give the context. That's where I do use the screens in the auditorium, uh, and I love showing maps. I love showing pictures of places that I've been. And I tell you what, our people love it. They absolutely tell me after a message, thanks for sharing that. And when I was younger, I thought people might, uh, you know, they might not like the fact that I would go visit a site in the Holy Land or Europe and see something. 
And obviously you could overdo that, but uh, we've taken three or four trips that really were educational and brought back a wealth of knowledge and shared it with our people. And they really appreciate that, you know. So uh, I think getting that context helps. So, you know, you, you start with the text, you move to the commentaries, you study the context in that way. And then as far as preparing the people, uh, we like to, you know, normally six or, six or eight weeks out, start talking about the series. I, I sometimes will talk to the music minister about the series. We'll start making graphics for the series, especially the New Year's series on courageous uh, living. And, uh, and then, you know, building that as something to look forward to. And then this year, uh, we wrote um, 50 devotionals on the subject of courageous living, put it into a book and passed it out on the first Sunday of the year. So while I'm preaching on courageous Christian living, they're at home studying that as a part of their daily devotions. And, and then Dr. Getch's messages were excellent to support that, which is a great help from an evangelist to do that. So, uh, and then as far as the altar call is concerned, um, I personally uh, am, as you know, Larry, traditional in the sense of, oh, I do like to have heads bowed and eyes closed. I don't know that there's a Bible verse that says you have to do that every time. But I think it's a meditative moment. I think this is where you're asking people Okay, go back over the content you just heard. And let's not let it just be content because the Bible says we're to be doers of the word. And, you know, the command of the pastors and the, the, the model of the Ephesian elders was, you know, uh, and other Jerusalem pastors was, we'll give ourselves continually to the word. So you've given yourself to the word. Now they've heard the word. Now they're going to respond. So heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And I just say, okay, what is God speaking to you about right now? Are, are you a courageous father really? Do you, do you, have you been taking time, as we saw in the text, to teach your children to love the Lord their God? Do you have time at home for this? And just let them think about it, you know. And then I, I do believe in the power of prayer, and I'll ask them if they'd like me to pray with them. And then I'll, of course, ask folks if they have accepted Christ as Savior. Now, sometimes if I feel that that's becoming too mundane, uh, I'll say, let's all stand together, you know, and I'll conduct that same type of invitation while they're standing. Sometimes, uh, if it's a large number of visitors, like an Easter or Christmas, I'll have everyone stand and I'll ask who has not yet accepted Christ. And if I see 30 to 50 hands, I'll just ask those people right there, folks that just lifted your hand, just would you look at me right here? And I'll go through the gospel again briefly with them and invite them to step out and come. So uh, the point is that you want to have a plan for the altar call but you want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because variables can present themselves even while you're preaching. Uh, but I, I believe in preaching for, uh, for an obedient response, and I believe in encouraging people to make decisions. Well, thanks for uh, sharing this, Dad. Would you, as we kind of conclude, just speak to the topic of preaching as uh, in light of our culture, uh, our world, and uh, just the necessity and need for more preachers? Well, Jesus had one prayer request. Jesus said, Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into the harvest. And the other day we had 90 pastors and school principals here at West Coast Baptist College interviewing, and, and they, they love our students because most of them are committed uh, to, to soul winning. One pastor said, I, I went to four colleges. West Coast was the only place where the students were asking, what kind of soul winning opportunities do you have for your staff? Other Christian colleges were asking, do they have to go to church on Sunday night? So I'm thankful for uh, the testimony of our students in that way. But I spoke to those 90 pastors and principals, and I thanked them for interviewing at West Coast. And then I reminded them that we cannot train students that aren't sent. And uh, many of them uh, are experiencing uh, this phenomenon of young people coming up through our Christian schools and churches who are going into secular pursuits at a much larger percentage than in years past. And I know that's a little bit touchy. You don't want to guilt trip a kid who feels like he wants to be a veterinarian. But my passion is to see young men and women going out into the ministry. So I would say to that question, number one, we need to pray for laborers and preachers in the harvest. And then secondly, as far as preaching in today's culture, you know, I was speaking to uh, our state senator a few days ago, and, and I was just telling her, you know, if you're going to run for re-election and you're going to be a Republican senator in California, 
you're going to have to be like Daniel, and you're going to have to determine that, you know, if they say you can't pray, throw the windows open and do what's right, you know. And I would say the same to pastors, you know. Uh, our instructions are clear. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. And, uh, and so whatever's going on in the culture, our message doesn't change, which is the tragedy of the woke movement right now. Um, and we just saw an article recently in uh, Fox News related to Wheaton College and how they just capitulated under their recent leadership, who's now moved to another college. But they capitulated on major issues. And they're training, apparently, ministerial people who now are you know, okay with drinking, okay with ordaining women into the ministry, you know, conversations about LGBTQ that aren't healthy. And so I, I would just say to all of that, and you know me, Larry, I could go on on that, on that tone for, for an hour, but with all of, all of the changes in the culture right now, if there's ever been a time for preachers to lovingly and patiently stand in that pulpit and proclaim the truth, it's right now. And don't waver because um, it, it confuses people and people are looking for the truth. Well, I want to thank you for joining uh, today's podcast. Hopefully this has been an encouragement to you, whether you're a pastor or you, whether you are loving and encouraging your pastor. Uh, hopefully uh, the topic has been a blessing to you. I want to tell you about one huge event that's coming up in September. It's our Spiritual Leadership Conference. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, there are conversations like these and many others that, that touch many different aspects uh, of ministry. The dates are September the 22nd through the 25th, and you can go ahead and register right now on SLC Conference, and we hope to see you there. Thanks for watching this podcast. Help us out by sharing it, leaving us a review. We'd appreciate it. We'll see you next month on next month's episode.